kinds of pets and animals. And uh, I had originally wanted to be a veterinarian from that. Oh, it was a good, good time. Uh, in a couple weeks here, February 7th, March 7th, we're almost through February, March 7th, we'll be doing a pancake breakfast. So come early at 9 a.m., come have your fill of pancakes. Uh, our elders will be putting this on. So come early, have some time just to be together a little bit and have some food and fellowship and then stay for worship. Also a reminder, as you leave today or if you want to do it on your phone or online or computer, you can give toward our offering. Our offering goes toward our ministries, goes toward really your personal relationship with Christ as you give all that you have toward Jesus, including your time, your resources, your money, everything as an act of worship to God. This morning we're starting a brand new sermon series that'll take us up to Easter. Uh, it's kind of crazy to think that we are closer to Easter than we are to Christmas or were to Christmas, even though it was snowing this morning. Yay, it's snowing again. <laughs> um, we're going to be doing a, um, a little bit of a walkthrough of First Peter. We're calling it a Sojourner's Guide. I don't know what kind of vacationer you are. Maybe you're one that likes to go on vacation and just do nothing, sit around on the beach, read books. Maybe you're a go-getter, you do activities, excursions, go, go, go. Or maybe you're kind of the find the local flair kind of a person. You want to go to the local farmer's market or that local restaurant or the back roads, that kind of thing. When uh, I went with uh, a couple of us, Dennis and, and the Ewers, to Honduras uh, a number of years ago for the first time, we took a small group to kind of do a, um, we called it a vision trip, to kind of just see what Honduras was like and to get to know the area. We went to some kind of local places. One of them was this place called Wally's Baleadas. And a Baleadas is a kind of a food they have in Honduras, and it's kind of a doughy uh, roll thing with um, eggs and avocado and different things inside of it. But we basically just kind of walked up on the street, and we um, got our food and ate on the sidewalk, basically, and it was delicious, amazing. Uh, I occasionally like to do this when I'm on trips. Just go where the locals go to eat. Go where the um, locals know what's what's best. So this this phrase we find throughout First Peter, sojourner. We've we've kind of attached this to our sermons. Here's a sojourner's guide. Peter wants us to imagine that we are sojourners, exiles. We're in a different kind of place, and we are to live there. He's talking to a group that are exiled in some way, but talking to us also is we are in a place where we are uncomfortable. We're not in heaven yet. We're believers. We're in a world of sin, and we need a guide to walk us through this life. One of the cool things we have going on right now, too, is that um, Elder Craig has been taking a group of people through First Peter in a preaching class also, which is awesome. Uh, so the plan this morning is to jump right into 1 Peter. We're going to look at the first two verses, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Uh, we'll kind of introduce ourselves to the book, some themes, when it was written, all that, and then really spend a lot of our time looking at Peter. Who is this guy that wrote this book, um, and what can we learn from his life? So let's open to 1 Peter 1, and then let's actually pray before we read this. Father, we come before you to read Scripture, to look into your word that uh, guides us, that has living words. And as we come to understand it, we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would uh, illuminate uh, our minds, help us to really understand and apply it to our lives. And as we look at the person of Peter and how you shaped him and grew him, um, Lord, help us just to be in awe how you pursue us. And Father, we pray for those who can't be with us right now, whether they're at home or sick or whatever it may be, Lord, uh, you'd comfort them. 
be with us now. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So 1 Peter 1, verses 1 and 2. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Sometimes we often kind of just skip over introductory parts to a letter or a part of the Bible, but there's a lot of meat already in here. Right away we see these two words that are so important to Peter in his book, elect exiles. That word exile can also be translated as sojourner. Someone who's on a journey, who is traveling. He, he is talking to this group, as we'll see in a moment, who is dispersed, who is uh, not maybe in their normal homes, and he wants to remind them to follow Jesus still. But he calls them elect, elect exiles. He's reminding them of God's great love for them. That they are chosen, loved by God first. They're not just uh, thrown away, suffering in some foreign land on a journey, but God has come to them, elected them, chosen them, loves them first, and then kind of gives this Trinitarian large overview of the Christian life. He says, according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, that God, the Father knows you, he loves you ahead of time. He then sanctifies you, makes you holy in your life through the Spirit, and then teaches you obedience with Jesus. See that Trinitarian, God the Father, Spirit, and Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not going to preach this time on 1 Peter 3 through 9. I actually preached on that in December, December 20th, if you want to go back and look that up. But let me give you kind of an overview of this book, some main uh, themes, who wrote this, I think it's always important to dive into a book of the Bible that you understand who is writing it, who they're writing to, and what are some of the big themes that are coming out. So obviously this is written by Peter. Peter is an apostle. Uh, we're going to read more about him a little bit later on. But written probably closer to the end of his life, 62 to 63 AD, so about 30 years after Christ's death. And it's coming into a time period of persecution for Christians under the emperor Nero and different people like that. We read right away in verse uh, 1 that this is written to a certain people, these Christians who are dispersed in Pontus and Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Uh, I think we even have a map of, of those places. So this is kind of modern day Turkey right up there. And this is important for one reason. As we read in the book of Acts, chapter 2, when the early church is starting out, Peter arises as this leader. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, there's all these people in Jerusalem, this long list of all these people from all over there. And in that list, we get some of these people from Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, who were in Jerusalem, who hear Peter's preaching and come to Christ and then seemingly bring back the faith to these areas. It spreads out. Christianity spreads in the early first century from Jerusalem, really, up north and northwest as Paul goes on mission trips then, too. But what is Peter writing about to these people? What are some of the big themes and thoughts you find in here? One, Christians are visiting foreigners and resident aliens. We are sojourners, as we've said. And we're going to see this over and over again. He's saying, you are aliens. You're, you're not made for this place. You're this misunderstood minority living under the rule of a different kingship than the Roman kingship or anything else. You are living in a foreign land, so be different. This is also a book that deals with suffering. But it's hope, hope in the midst of suffering and then future exaltation from God in the midst of suffering. He's going to talk about why. Why do Christians 
suffer for their faith? And then what should we do about it? What should Christians do when we suffer? They also want holiness as this idea of how do we suffer well for our faith? He says you should pursue holiness. Be like God because he is holy. You should be holy. And how the, the ramifications for what that looks like in your own life to be holy, to be like God. Along with suffering, we have persecution. So the big theme he's going to talk about is persecution offers a chance an opportunity for us to show others the generous love of Jesus. If you are persecuting me for my faith, I can still love you back. Another theme is identity. And he uses a lot of Old Testament ideas and phrases. He calls us living stones, a holy priesthood, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. That you are not just your own, that you were bought with a price, that you are Christ. Your identity is changed now in Jesus. And then one of my favorite verses and really chapters, chapter 5, he'll deal with these thoughts of anxiety and humility and how to cast our cares upon God because he cares for us. Well, really for the bulk of our time, I want to talk about Peter, the guy who wrote this book. Toward the end of his life, before he died, let's talk about Peter. Many people can relate to Peter. He's, he's a character. <laughs> and we, we get to the, kind of the life of Paul, we get the life of different Old Testament characters, but we get these little hints over Scripture of who Peter was, his personality, his, his, his character, his flaws, how God shaped him, changed him, used him. And I, I found so much hope and encouragement in looking at a guy like Peter, uh, who was not perfect by any means, but God used him in so many powerful ways. So we'll look at kind of three parts to his life, kind of his before Jesus time, the training, discipling that he got from Jesus, and then afterwards, his time with the disciples in the early church. So what was his life like before he met Jesus? Well, he was originally born in this town of Bethsaida. It's kind of near the Sea of Galilee, so north of Jerusalem. We know he had a brother named Andrew. We know his father was, was John or Jonah. Uh, and soon after, early on in his life, he, he moves from Bethsaida to Capernaum, actually gets married. We don't know much about his, his marriage and family, but at one point, Jesus actually comes to his house and heals his, his mother-in-law. But a big part of his early life was he was a fisherman, probably a family business. Now, don't think of him as a, a fisherman in terms of just, you know, sitting on a dock and casting a pole. I mean, fishing in that time period as a lifestyle was hard work. Sometimes if you, you kind of see these pictures of Peter, it's kind of with a big white beard, older. Um, I want you to picture him as kind of at this point, just this kind of young, strapping, burly kind of guy. I mean, fishing was hard work. You're, you're working all night sometimes on a boat, sweating with these big nets with your bare hands, um, getting dirty and sweaty and probably calloused up hands. This was Peter's entire life was going fishing, seeing what the sea would give to him, catching fish, selling it. Kent Hughes, author, pastor, he kind of describes Peter in this way. When I think of Peter, I imagine a broad-shouldered, loud, extroverted, assertive man who is always sweating. He was a headstrong, unbridled hulk who is always getting into all kinds of trouble and causing his master plenty of the same. So that's his early life. He's a fisherman, family business, married. But then Jesus comes into his life, and it's around fishing that Jesus first 
shows up. There's, there's two stories we have that are probably uh, two, two angles of the same story, uh, one in Matthew and then one in Luke, of Jesus' first interaction with Peter. Um, we're going to be in the Gospels a lot this morning, so if you want to follow along, you can, or I'll just read them. But this is from Matthew chapter 4, verse 18 to 20. Peter's out fishing. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, Jesus saw two brothers, Simon, who's called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. Matthew gives us this very bare bones uh, story of Jesus' first interaction with Peter. They're fishing. Jesus sees them. Hey, you, come follow me. Immediately drop everything, and then they followed. Luke kind of expands and talks a little more about what happens. Luke chapter 5. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on Jesus to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats by the lake. But the fishermen had gone out of them and were fishing or washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, that's, that's Peter, he asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Peter, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Simon Peter answered, uh, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I'll let down the nets. They were fishing all night, caught nothing at all. I mean, this is not the time now to fish. This is the next day. It's morning. They're exhausted. Jesus said, okay, you could go try again. When they had done this, verse 6, they closed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in their boat to come and help them, but, and they came and filled both the boats, so they began to sink. Look what Peter does then. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. I don't know if this is how you would respond to this incident. This miracle just happened, you know, all night, caught no fish. Finally, Jesus comes and says, go fish over here. And tons of fish come, and Peter says, get away from me. There's something that Peter can see sometimes about Jesus that others don't. Something about Peter sees Jesus holiness or purity that's a connect with miracles and his Peter's unholiness. He immediately goes to, I am a sinful man. But Jesus responds in verse 9, for he and all who were with him were astonished to catch a fish. They take in also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partnered with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. And when they brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Again, there's that dramatic, left everything and followed Jesus. Immediately, they left everything and followed him. And so begins Peter's journey with Jesus. As we saw in these few verses, he's originally called Simon. And early on, at some point, Jesus actually changes his name from Simon to Peter. Peter meaning rock or stone, which Jesus gives some, some, some weight or definition to later. But he, Peter's like the original Rocky. He's the original The Rock. I mean, what a great nickname, right? Rock, stone. This is Peter. And throughout Jesus' ministry, Jesus kind of pulls Peter aside with him, brings him into this kind of inner circle of the 12. In fact, every time that Peter and the disciples are mentioned, the 12 disciples, Peter comes first. And there's times when Jesus will do something significant and pull away Peter, James, and John. So it's just the, the three of them plus Jesus doing something. Um, in Mark chapter 5, verse 37 
And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James, as they go to heal a, a girl who was dead and bring her back to life. Even this crazy, strange moment where Jesus is up on a mountain and he is being transfigured, changed, being shown his glory. In Mark chapter 9, verse 2, uh, after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured. And then toward the end of Jesus' earthly ministry as he's praying in the garden before his crucifixion, he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. Even as his last moments praying before the end of his life, he takes along Peter, James, and John. Peter has this strange thing he does where he often, though, will speak before he thinks. Or he'll just act and go and do before he thinks. He's, I think he's a kind of a verbal processor. <laughs> uh, anybody out there, you kind of more, you, you, uh, you talk before you think or you act before you think? Yeah, this is Peter. Even at the transfiguration, when they're up there, they're, they're seeing how amazing and glorious this whole thing is. Peter just starts talking. He goes, Rabbi, it is good that we're here. Um, let's make three tents. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. He's just, I'm going to go. <laughs> Yesterday, I was out driving with my kids, and um, we, we found this this podcast that's for kids it's called god's big story if you've got little kids out there i'd recommend it um, and we came across this story of jesus walking on the water mark chapter 14 verse 25 look how peter interacts with this story and in the fourth watch of the night jesus came to them walking on the sea the disciples are in a boat they're they're going across the sea and then all of a sudden jesus starts walking on the water but when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. Immediately, Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Well, put yourself in, in the disciples or Peter's shoes here. Like, what, what would you do at this moment? Would you just like jump out of the boat, swim away? Would you talk to Jesus? Would you just kind of be in awe? Look what Peter does. Verse 28. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. I don't, I don't know if I would say that. <laughs> Jesus said, come. So Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water, and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he became afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got in the boat, the wind ceased. I mean, that's just Peter's rambunctious like style. Like, I'm going to say, do first before I think or anything. He has this kind of weird hobby, too, of jumping out of boats <laughs> with his clothes on. He just jumps out of boats often. Even in the moment when Jesus is being arrested, his actions kind of take over. John 18, verse 10, Jesus is about to be arrested. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, a fisherman with a sword, why does a fisherman have a sword? Drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into your sheath. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? I often wonder with this passage, you know, Peter, he cuts off this guy's ear. He's either a really good swordsman you know, to go for somebody's ear or a really terrible swordsman. He's probably going for the head and just somehow grazes the ear on the side, right? But he also has these just profound moments when he speaks, these claims he makes. John chapter 6, when Jesus has been talking about some really difficult theology and hard things. He, he even says, you know, you must eat my flesh 
drink by blood, this kind of different phrasing he's saying about coming to trust in him and believe in him, all these things. And verse 66, after this, many of the disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. And Jesus said to the 12, do do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. What profound words those are that there's nowhere else we can go, God. There's nowhere else we can go, Jesus, that you have the words of of life that give me eternity in this life and the next. And we come to know you as the Holy One of God. In fact, he's the first one to, to say, to proclaim that Jesus is the Messiah, that he's this special anointed Christ. Matthew 16, starting at 13. When Jesus came to the districts of Syria, Philippi, he asked the disciples, who do the people say that the Son of Man is? Who do the people say I am? Who's Jesus? Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah, one of the prophets. And Jesus said to the disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter replied, you're the Christ. The son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon bar Jonah, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, my father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, remember? You're the rock. And on this rock, I will build my church, not on Peter himself, but on this, this phrasing, this, this idea that he says that you are the Christ and the gates of hell should not prevail against it. But he even makes these ridiculous claims too. He, he bumbles over his words and his thoughts. And right after that in Mark 16, after he just pronounced that you are the, you're the Christ, the Holy One of God, look what it says. From that time, starting at verse 21, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. He's saying, I'm going to the cross. I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to die. In verse 22, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. (laughs) Peter says, far be it from you, Lord. This this shall never happen to you. Do you imagine this? I mean, Peter, he's taking Jesus aside and just saying, Jesus, no, you can't speak like that, buddy. You can't go to the cross. I mean, this is not for you. This is not your way. Jesus turns to Peter. Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Even when Jesus is coming to wash the disciples' feet, he's coming around, he has the rag, he comes to Peter. Peter says, Lord, you're going to wash my feet? Jesus answered him, what am I, what, am, what I am doing, you don't understand now, but afterwards you will understand. Peter said to me, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I don't wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. He gets it finally, go, do it. But one of the lowest hardest parts of Peter's story is right before Jesus' crucifixion, he's he's arrested, and Peter denies Jesus. Jesus even tells Peter, this is going to happen. You're going to come to a moment in your life where you don't want to be known for me. You're going to deny that you even know me. He even tells Peter that Satan has asked to sift you like wheat, and I prayed for you, that you'll turn and then strengthen your brothers. This is in Luke chapter 22. Then they seized Jesus and led him away, bring him into the high priest's house, and Peter was following at a distance. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, said, This man also is with him. 
But Peter denied it, saying, Woman, I don't even know him. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, You also, you're one of them. But Peter said, Man, I, I am not. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, So this man also is with him, for he too, he's Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you're talking about. And immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. I can't imagine to be in Peter's shoes that moment. After Jesus is crucified, resurrected, he appears to the disciples, he appears to Peter multiple times. And it appears at one point in the book of John that Peter has kind of gone back to fishing. Maybe he's given up the discipleship lifestyle. We, we don't really know, but he is out fishing. And something similar happens, like his early uh, call to discipleship. Jesus comes to him while he is fishing, does something amazing with what he is doing. And then it says, Jesus speaks to Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Then feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Then tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Peter denied him three times. Jesus came to him three times with this phrase, do you love me? I think kind of reinstating, reinvigorating, encouraging Peter in his lowest of low moments. When Jesus is resurrected, he's ascended then, the, the disciples are kind of in a disarray. Their, their leader is gone. <clears throat> but Peter is the one early on who steps up to lead. Peter, the, the leader. He, he preaches at this moment of Pentecost. 3,000 people come to know Christ. He does miracles himself. He, he brings back the little girl to life. He's arrested for preaching the gospel in the book of Acts. Uh, God uses Peter to make a way for non-Jews, even Gentiles, to come to him. He's arrested, freed by an angel. He's still learning and growing. At some point, Paul confronts him about some of his actions. But it's likely that uh, toward the end of his life, he's actually crucified. We don't get this in the Bible, but from other sources that seem to say that uh, Tertullian, Origen, Eusebius, that he was crucified actually upside down. And so this letter he writes, First Peter, is toward the end of his life before he is crucified. Three things I want to just pull out of Peter's life. Number one, God can use anybody. If you get nothing else from the story of Peter or the characters in the Bible, it is that God can use anybody. There are so many people in the Bible that are, that are murderers, that are liars, or cheats, adulterers, thieves, whatever it is. I mean, not the people that I would choose, not the ones that you would choose to use, but God can and does use anybody. He uses a guy like Peter who denies him, who doubts him, who says the wrong thing. All of these things that, you know, we probably wouldn't put on our resumes. God can use anybody, and he does. He can use even you to share the gospel with your, your neighbors, your coworkers, your friends, your family. God can use anybody, even you. Number two is that God forgives what an amazing picture of God's forgiveness and grace in the life of Peter. 
he, at the moment of, of where all of history kind of culminates, the crucifixion, he denies knowing his Lord and Savior, but Jesus pursues him, offers him forgiveness to go on and do ministry and lead others to Christ. If he can forgive a thing like that, he can forgive anything that you have done yourself. God forgives. And third is that God grows us. We see this picture of this guy, this fisherman who's, you know, all on his own, out there fishing with his brother, being called, chosen by Jesus, shaped, molded to become this leader in the early church, preaching to 3,000 plus people that come to know him. God grows us. You're on a journey. Jesus is your guide. You never stop growing, learning, becoming more like him. Ken Boa says, the same Holy Spirit who worked transformation in Peter's life is actively at work transforming those of us who have placed our faith in Christ. How great is that? Next week, we'll dive into the actual book of First Peter and read some more and see what Peter says for us. But hey, let me challenge you this next week. Read the whole book of First Peter. Read it a couple times. See those themes. See the life of Peter coming out in there. Let's pray now. Jesus Christ, I thank you that you called a guy like Peter. You took him, you chose him, and you developed him, you poured into him, you taught him. And God, I can see a lot of myself in him, a lot of my faults, my failures. But Jesus, we are thankful that you take people who fail all the time. I'm thankful that you take people who are sinners. You forgive, you offer grace, you, you use us for your ministry and glory to shine out who you are in dark places. And so God, as we dive into this book of 1 Peter the next few weeks, would you help us to understand what it means to be on a journey, to be exiled sojourners in this crazy, strange land that we find ourselves in, not in heaven yet, but that's our destination. So God, be with us now, sing through us in this last song, and we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.